Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Andreas. I'm a formal verification engineer at uh, Bloxwork, and um, I'm going to uh, talk to you a bit about the uh, formal verification of uh, protocols. Um, in the beginning, I will just introduce you a bit to what I uh, mean by formal verification and more generally formal methods. Later on, I will talk a bit about invariance and uh, function properties. And uh, so then I'll go into formal verification of, of one of our uh, contracts from the LSD networks, what's called uh, the giant SAP pool. Um, uh, and in the end, I will just compare some of the uh, different verification tools um, that can be used. Um, yeah, so what is uh, formal methods? So um, formal methods can be, it's, it means a lot of things, and it probably means different things to different people, but uh, I think it's, it's some, something along the lines of using a system of logic to verify, specify, and, or, or for modeling. Um, an example of uh, formal verification is, is, is the top, uh, the top left, left rule I have here. It's, um, and it's, um, it's a uh, natural deduction uh, derivation tree. In the bottom of the tree, um, we have the conclusion that we want to prove, um, and uh, the tree is a proof of the, the conclusion here in this case. So I think this is quite similar to, uh, to uh, matching logic, where the, the proof that uh, the K-framework um, builds will be um, something that, that can be something of this nature that can be checked by a proof checker. Um, another alternative to formal um, methods is to use a type theory. So in type theory, what we do is that we, instead of writing a proof tree, um, we are writing a, a, a type theory term uh, to, to derive the conclusion. So in type theory, we would be, for example, if we want to prove that A implies B and B implies C, uh, then A, A implies C. That is just the function composition in, uh, in uh, type theory. So if you have a function from A to B and you have a function from B to C, then we can construct a function from A to C. Um, and the type, what, what Type the uh, checker does is that actually given the term it constructs the proof tree the proof tree similar to one to the proof tree from a natural deduction. Um, so that is the act of type checking. Um, then an another approach is to use something like a more automated approach, which is, is for example is SMT servers. Um, so in SMT servers, we just state the conclusion we want um, the, the the server to to prove for us, and then the the job of the SMT server is to is to generate a, a, a proof of this uh, conclusion. Um, so this, this, this problem is known to be undecidable, so it is some, there would be some problems that the SMT solver would not be able to answer yes or no on, but uh, in practice, um, they, they, they tend to work quite well um, because our, our, the inputs we give them are typically not too, too difficult. Um, so, yeah, so example of function properties and invariance. So, a function property for math is that the uh, zero is unit of, of, of addition, so x plus zero is equal to x, that is a, um, a, a property of plus. Um, an example from the ERC20 contract is that um, if, uh, if, if suppose we have an amount which is less than or equal to the balance of, of the sender, then the, the token that transfer is going to always return true, assuming we have sufficient gas. Um, and in, invariant from math, is uh, invariant is just a relation that holds before a function and uh, after the function as well. So, for example, if, if x is less than or equal to y, then x plus k is uh, less than or equal to uh, y plus k. Um, and in, invariant from the ESC20 contract is that um, if, we have, if we take the sum of all the, the balance of, of all addresses, then that is going to be equal to the total supply of, uh, of tokens in, in supply. Um, yes, so, so what we would like to say here with this invariant is that every, every, every function needs to, to, to satisfy this. So no matter which function from the ESC 20 contract we call, it must satisfy this property. We must not, we must not lose any um, uh, tokens and we must, we must not have too many tokens um, compared to the total supply. Um, so yeah, so how, how do we identify function properties? Um, this, is, uh, this is tricky, um, and I think this is, this is the hardest part about formal verification in, 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 in my mind. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's figuring out what, what are the properties we want to have for, for our functions. Um, an example here from the SC20 contract is that 
when we transfer an amount to a recipient, then the, the, the balance of the recipient must have increased and the, 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 the balance of the sender must have decreased. Um, it's pretty simple uh, property that needs to hold uh, when we transfer money or tokens. Um, and also, yeah, so, uh, something that is very easy to, uh, to forget is that forgetting to, to check the invalid inputs of our functions. So we, this is, I just wanted to put it here because it's, it's something that's easy to forget. And so, for example, that the, for example, the token that transfer from um, uh, function from the ESC20 contract, um, that requires that uh, the, the, the address from has given the sender allowance to spend um, the tokens. So it, it, if, if the allowance has not been given, then the transfer form must not return true. Um, and uh, then to identify invariants, there are two kinds of invariants that are important to think about. So one kind of invariant is that one that is just induced from the function properties that we want to hold. So for example, um, the, when we, we, the, the transfer function from the ESC20 contract requires that it returns true if, the, if the, there is sufficient uh, balance from the sender. Um, so that means that given any two addresses, A and B, if we add them together, that must not overflow. Um, and, yeah. and, and, and another invariant from the ESC20 contract is something that we can think of as a security invariant or an accounting invariant that this, this that we, we, need, we want the, the sum of all the balances to be the total total token supply to ensure that um, nobody has can steal any uh, tokens, or uh, also that we all the tokens has we don't, haven't haven't lost any tokens somehow. Um, so now I'll just go a little into how um, how the giant AB pool uh, works, the contract, and then afterwards show you some how I have uh, formalized some of the rules. Um, for the, some properties of that contract um, afterwards. Um, so, so on the left side, we have some happy users over there, and they want to they want to use the the, the giant save ETH pool. So, what they can do is that they can deposit ETH, and then in return, they will get uh, LP tokens. They deposit ETH to a um, batch in the giant save ETH pool, and assuming that batch has not been staked yet, they can still well, they are still allowed to withdraw the ETH. They can get it back by paying back the LP tokens. Um, when we have a full batch, then that can be staked to an LSD network, and in return, the users can get um, DETH by paying the LP tokens. And the DETH is a yield-bearing token, um, so they can, uh, yeah, they can later on claim uh, ETH rewards for, for holding this uh, DETH. Um, yeah, so how did I, um, how did I verify this? So let me just go here, see if this works. Yep. Go to the LSD tab. Right there. Okay, so the giant save ETH pool. So this is uh, this is our examples of how I used um, Satora to, to, to verify the giant save ETH pool. For example, the first the first rule here. Let me, let me expand that. Um, so what 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 we essentially what what we want this rule uh, the, what the rule says is that um, when we transfer um, ETH. When we deposit ETH to the giant save ETH pool, then the, the balance of the sender must have decreased and the balance of the pool must have increased, um, the ETH balances. So the way we do this in Satora is that first we're getting the address of the giant, that this is the giant save ETH pool. Um, afterwards, we require that the sender is not the giant save ETH pool because the giant save ETH pool doesn't make sense that it will be sending, um, depositing to itself. So we, we, we disregard that case. And then afterwards, um, we get the, the balance of the giant save ETH pool, and we get the balance of the sender. Um, then we deposit ETH, and then we, again, we get the balance of the giant save ETH pool and the sender, and then we check that the, the balance of the, the giant save ETH pool has increased by the amount, and we check that the balance of the sender has decreased by the amount. Um, and then what, what actually happens when we write this rule and say, go and Satora, so this Satora is a, is it uses an empty SMT server behind the hood, so this is just a specification. And, um, and then Satoro is going to uh, create a proof for us. And then if we go here and click on the report, it will, it will give us a green check mark if it, if it was able to prove that this specification holds. Um, so if, if it's able to do so, it will, not, um, it will not say much, but if it was not able to do so, it will, it will give us some information about uh, which uh, assertion went wrong, and. Uh, give us some uh, variables um, 
showing us uh, how, uh, what, is the, what is the counter example, so we can uh, go and uh, debug our contract or debug our, our specification. Another, uh, another uh, property that we would like is that uh, when we are um, depositing ETH, then we want it to um, uh, mint uh, LP tokens for the user. So, so what, how we check this is that we check we get the balance of the we get the balance of the sender who's the user, and then we require here. This is an internal invariant in the ERC20 contract that we need to require because. Um, Satora is, doesn't know anything about the, the, the state before calling this, uh, before calling the contract. So we need to require here that the balance, the balance of the, this particular user is less than or equal to the total supply of uh, tokens. Um, so it's just, just an internal environment that we need to require in order for this to go through. Um, and then afterwards we deposit an amount and, uh, and we get the, 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 the balance again, the token balance after we have uh, deposited and we check that we have indeed increased the amount of tokens by, um, by the correct amount. Um, and these are the tokens that you get when you deposit ETH and you can pay those to withdraw ETH and you can pay them also to, uh, to withdraw the ETH after the batch has been staked. Another rule that I think is nice is this one. So this one is more complicated than the others. Um, so, it says that when we withdraw uh, ETH, then it will decrease the withdrawable amount of ETH. So, um, our contracts are, are quite big, so we have to make simplifying assumptions for Satora to actually be able to prove it. So, what, what, I'm, what I'm doing here is that I'm, I'm requiring that the, the number of batches is, is not, before we start, that the number of batches is less than or equal to three because zero is included. So, we have, must have at most three batches when we start withdrawing. Then I'm requiring some internal invariants that are required for the. Um, these are internal invariants of the um, of the contract itself, of the giant save ETH pool contract that I'm requiring in order to ensure that we are in a consistent state before we are uh, executing the the functions here. So the withdrawable amount of ETH um, function will return the withdrawable amount of ETH. That is the how how much ETH can be withdrawn. Um, at, at the, by this user at this time. Um, so after we, if, after the user have deposited ETH, he will be able to withdraw something, and the withdraw ETH amount, uh, withdraw, um, withdrawable amount of ETH will return the amount that it can, that can maximally be uh, withdrawn. Um, then I am uh, going to require here for this, in this particular case, I'm requiring that the, the ETH um, is ETH before is less than or equal to the to the amount, so the, the, the withdrawable amount of ETH, ETH is less than or equal to the amount that we actually want to withdraw, so it should pass. Then we are calling the withdraw, and then we get the withdrawable amount of ETH afterwards again, and then we check that the withdrawable amount of ETH has decreased by the amount that we have uh, withdrawn. And, and the other case is that uh, in case that the withdrawable amount of ETH is smaller than the amount, so in, in, in this rule, we do not have to check all the in, internal state is, is, is correct, because it, if it works for all states, it also works for the states where all the states where the internal state is correct. So, in, and so it works here just by checking that the withdrawable amount of ETH, if the withdrawable amount of ETH of the sender is smaller than the, the amount we're trying to withdraw, then, it's going to, uh, then the withdrawal is going to fail. And um, yeah, here, here in, in the end, I would like to compare some of the different verification tools that, uh, that I have worked with. Um, so first, let me go, go through Satora, which I have been working on lately. Um, so in Satora, we have uh, proofs are fully automated. You're just writing these rules that you saw, and then the, the, the proof will say yes or no whether the, it, uh, it passes, but there are uh, some limitations to this tool but, um, that, 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 that it's quite slow, for example. So, so, so the, way, the way we are, so it's slow, and especially on, on large projects. So the way we are um, combating this is by using we are mocking up contracts to make make simplify uh, simplify um, everything. However, it's very easy to learn, so that's uh, that's a big plus of Satora. An alternative to this is a framework that uh, Gregor talked about, um, and it, it 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 can potentially scale to a large project because we can add lemmas to 
improve um, the, the verification time so, 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 so the proofs can, can go faster. If, if we think it's, it's, it's going too slow, we can always add additional lemmas to make it faster. Um, so this makes proof semi-automatic, -auto but, uh, but it's still highly optimized, uh, highly auto automated, I would say, and uh, it's, 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 it's hard to learn, but it's, it's also fairly uh, uh, approachable, for, also I think for a, a regular developer. Just sit, sit down and spend a, 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 some time learning K-Framework, and uh, it, it is definitely the, something that, that regular developers can learn. So another alternative is to use uh, COG, which, is, uh, well, which has super fast uh, proof checking. It's just type checking. Um, but however, um, the proofs are mostly manual. You have to write all the proof terms, as you, as you saw in, uh, in type theory. We write the terms, and, we, and, uh, and that, can, that can be difficult and, and take a long time. Um, but COG scales to, 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 to large projects. That has been shown, for example, with the verification of, uh, of entire compilers, which is... Uh, yeah, it, it shows that COG can, can scale. Um, however, it's, it's hard to learn, and it requires a lot of expertise um, to do these, uh, to do the proofs manually. Another way of verifying is to use uh, testing, and in particular, foundry testing for Solidity, for example. So it, it, most tests, they run super fast, and it, it's, it's easy to, to write them. Um, but the problem with it is that it's too, tests are typically uh, incomplete. Um, so with, with proofs, we're proving the, the specification correct. With testing, we are only testing the particular scenarios that we have set up. Um, however, so, so it's, it's the, the, the thing about testing is that you cannot really get away from it. Um, so it's, it's very fast to write a test. So we just, we can, before we even start with formal verification, we, we can write tests to find as many bugs as possible before even trying to formalize. Because formalizing something first and then figuring out there was a bug, Go and change the bug. It's very expensive to afterwards go and fix the the, the, the formalization to, to 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 account for the changes that have been made to the code. So we want to do that as late as possible. Um, yeah. So that was uh, all for me, and uh, I will give the word to uh, Armin now from the Satora team. Hi everyone, Armin. Uh, I'm a security engineer at Satora. I'm going to talk about the formal verification contest we had with BlockSwap and Code Arena. Um, give you a little bit on that. Uh, so we had to think of a slightly different incentive model for a formal verification contest versus an audit contest. Usually you reward bugs and how rare they are. Here we can have properties that uh, increase the code coverage and can potentially prevent future bugs. So we want to reward properties that improve the security of the code. The way we did this is by, um, of course, rewarding properties that catch real bugs, but also uh, rewarding properties that after they're written at the end of submissions, bugs are injected and we, if, if your property caught that bug, that means it was um, increasing the code coverage and therefore valuable. Um, there's also a small part of the participation, a uh, small part of the reward going to participation, which is just um, kind of like an easy task. There are public bugs that you just have to catch. This is as a, a way of investing in the community's education to potentially have uh, more valuable contests in the future. Um, so once everything's submitted, uh, the way it's submitted is everyone has a private fork and then you create a pull request. Uh, we have this um, CI running that injects all the bugs and then runs e all the specs against all the bugs and right away you can know how well you did. So in this uh, photo you can see all the scripts are running. The first one is verify original.patch so there's no changes to the code. You want your uh, properties to be passing on the original code and then failing when there's a bug injection. So this person caught uh, four of the 10 bugs that we'd injected and they got the appropriate rewards. Um, so these are some highlights from the contest. There was over 180 registrants. Um, many of them started and submitted uh, their specification. 26 of them caught at least one of the injected bugs, 21 got rewarded. You can see we, wrote, we have over 600 properties written. Um, we have to scale that down and find all the duplicates into a master spec, but it, it was a pretty big effort by a lot of people. We uh, caught some bugs that were also fixed and rewarded the particip participants with $30,000. Um, so yeah, again, thanks to the BlockSwap team and the Code Arena team for um, facilitating this. And uh, I can give you a little overview of the contract that we verified. So it's a smaller contract, but it's very important because it handles um, rewards. So the, specifically the distribution of fees and MEV for the node operators and the stakers. 
um, you could see the contract uh, place in the LSD network. Uh, you could see all the rewards going to it, and then it's responsible for sending out the rewards uh, correctly. So it's pretty important. It's a very core uh, contract, and um, it was a good contract to use for the first formal verification contest because there's a lot of people um, learning a tool for the first time, and yeah, it proved to be very successful. Um, so here's some uh, kind of happy people after the contest. The, a lot of people liked the tool. Uh, really enjoyed the contest, um, super interested in formal verification and want to participate in uh, future contests. So that's really exciting and we look forward to doing more of these. Thank you guys.